Welcome to the Sporty Sibling Podcast. Where we score touchdowns and make bad It's a trio. Trio drives down and throws it down. Oh, Alonzo Trio. Today they're going to match off and talk about. Welcome back to the Sporty Saving Podcast. Thank you so much for having us back for our Wednesday show here on Roku channel, YouTube stuff. Yeah, a lot of words make me smarticles, right? <laughs> but yes, thank you so much for having us back here, guys. And we're so appreciative. We actually have a little bit to talk about today. So obviously, we're going to talk about the James, no, LeBron James and Bronny James being able to play together now that he's committed to USC, what's going to be the challenge of him and LeBron James actually playing? That's going to be an interesting, you know, duo. We're also going to talk about, uh, you know, our way too early top 25 for college men's basketball. I like this. It's going to be fun. And, of course, we're going to talk about the Astros' r- rookie pitching sensation. That is just sweeping the nation. And yes, I meant it to rhyme. So Panda, take us to our first topic. Thank you for that, Panda. And for those listening, we're going to be talking about LeBron and Bronny James playing together. So, LeBron James has been talking about playing next to his son since his son could walk. Okay? But... There has been three main challenges stopping them from actually bringing this, you know, dream to come true to fruition. So let's talk about each one of those challenges and what really, you know, whether they actually succeeded in it and how close they are to making this dream come true. And of course, you know, as you know, congratulations to Bronny James and USC for committing to each other and, you know, making it there. So, challenge number one. Could LeBron James play into his late 30s and early 40s? The only way for him to be able to to see this dream come true was for him to play into his late age, which we have seen players do. But he had to play not only into that age, but at a high level to make it worthwhile for teams to continue to keep playing with him. Otherwise, all this would be for nothing. But as James has not only been playing into his late age, he's also been playing as one of the best NBA players in the league and a future Hall of Famer. So I think we can arguably say that challenge number one is a 100% success. Challenge number two. This is the one where I think it was going to really be all over the place. I mean, we really could never tell the future. Yes, there was an idea of what he what could be, but not what it actually would be. So challenge number two is will Bronny develop into NBA caliber talent? Okay, Bronny James is a talented. Based, this is I'm gonna give you the scouting report based on you know what I've seen people write about him to you know towards his from his high school uh, p- playing games into his you no know, development to the commitment he has at USC. So, based on everything that I've read, this is my evaluation of him plus in the few I've only seen like four or five games of him play, so I'm just going to give this to you. So, Bronny James is a talented basketball player with a well-rounded skill set. However, he is known for his unselfish play, willingness to pass the ball and a strong defense. His best offensive skill is his ability to shoot accurately from long range and is good with and has good mechanics, which is good. I like that. I appreciate that. Although he still needs to develop his skills as a playmaker, which that's what his dad is. He is explosive in transition, which I am impressed by. That is one of the first thing I, I wrote is transition. Boom. He's also able to move quickly with the ball and can absorb contact while remaining in control. Again, I also was very much a fan of this because it showed that, you know, you can press up against them, but he's not going to lose the ball, allowing a turnover or a missed basket. 
Bronny can play with or without the ball, but is currently better suited to play off the ball. Now, this is something that I kind of struggle with. I actually don't agree with this, even though everybody else does. I think he's better uh, with the ball. But, hey, it is what it is. I'm not an expert analyst like some of these people are, so I'll give it to them. Overall, he is a mature player with a well-rounded game, and while he may not always seem he be seen as a spectacular talent, he has the potential to develop into a top-level player. And that is the key word that I put in here, key sentence here. He has the potential to develop into a top-level player. And that kind of answers the, the question that we had. Will Bronny develop into NBA-caliber talent? And I think, yes, I think that is completely in agreement here. And that makes challenge number two win. The reason why, though, I agree with it is because he has all the... Uh, all the ability to be able to develop into an NBA caliber talent. Now, does he have work to do? Of course, he's no protege like his dad it was when he came. He was coming out of high school. But there is an argument that I that any any of us could make that if high school students could enter the league, somebody might take a chance of drafting Bronny straight out of high school. Now, here's the question. Is he a first round pick out of high school or is he a no last round out of high school? Oh, now that is where things get interesting. All right. So right now, to me, he's a last pick in the draft kind of talent. He's talented enough to get into the NBA and make moves. But is he enough to be like his dad who was drafted in the first round by the Cavaliers in 03? Man, no, he's not he's not there yet, but he can be. So with his commitment to USC, I think it was it's perfect, perfect for him to go to college and develop his talents and be able to become that NBA caliber talent that we know he can be because he is showing those skill sets now. Right? This commitment to USC, he can use it to develop his skills even further than they are now. Plus, we always see him playing with his dad and learning from his dad, which allows him to develop even further. So, again, to say that he's developing into an NBA caliber talent is correct. So, again, check mark at challenge number two. Challenge number three is one that, well, we, we won't know really until Bronny actually enters the league. And this is just all speculation, of course. Okay, so how can a franchise afford both LeBron James and Bronny James to play together? Okay, so looking into the beginning of it, Bronny James can enter the draft in 2024, but his dad is still on the contract through 2024, through the 2024 year with the Lakers. So unless the Lakers are going to take him, you know, He's really going to have to wait till 2025 to guarantee a spot to do it because no one's guaranteed that they're going to be able to take. All right. But for our sake, we're just going to say he waits the year because that is a free agent in 2025. Bronny enters the league in 2025. OK, what is a contract? What does a team have to do to contract both these players? OK to be able to have them play together, and how will that look? Well, first, let's go on the easy side, which is Bronny's contract. Bronny's going to go into a rookie contract, and he's looking at around a four-year contract with uh, inflation and everything, ruffling the numbers. He's going to have a four-year contract averaging anywhere between 7 and $35 million, depending on where in the first round they he they're going to be dra- he's going to be drafted because let's be serious he's going to be drafted in the first round okay this also will include more than likely a fourth year option that comes that comes with a 26 to 80% pay increase and a qualifying offer as well so that's going to be the easy part here ladies and gentlemen because now we know that Bronny does have a contract how will LeBron's contract look now? So LeBron contract, he's been averaging about a two to four year contract worth about 30 million per year with roughly 80 million guaranteed at signing. 
So any team that's going to want LeBron James is going to have to get roughly about $35 million for either one or two years with roughly $85 to $90 million guaranteed at signing to be able to make it worthwhile for him to come play for them. Lucky for us, whatever team does sign LeBron James won't have to sign him for long because we're, we're more than likely he's going to pay one, two more years with Bronny and then more than likely retired. He said it himself. He's probably going to play. He wants to play until his son is there. And after that, he's probably done. So anything that does sign him gets a little break and will probably have a minor one to two year deal that saves them money. The deal will probably look somewhat what the Lakers just gave him in 21, 22. Uh, it's a two year, uh, two year contract averaging 42 million per year with 85 million guaranteed. So that is probably the same contract we're looking at here. So, you know, this is still a yet to be seen, but it's a very manageable challenge number three. Uh, it's a very manageable challenge, to be honest with you. In the end, the side of LeBron and Bronny James playing games together will be heartwarming. Their bond as father and son goes beyond basketball and inspired us all. LeBron's passion for the game is being passed on to his son, and it's incredible to see Bronny already displaying his father's, his father's immensible, immensible talent. This duo reminds us that family is everything, and that sports can bring people together uni in very unique ways. So I can't wait to see this happen, and I, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But Panda, take us to the next topic. <laughs> Thank you for that, Panda. And now we're going to talk about the men's college top 25 way too early edition, of course, because we got to do it because we talked about LeBron James and Bronny James. We have to bring this in. And just to get started, as the college basketball season draws near, ladies and gentlemen, there is already high anticipation for the upcoming season. Fans eagerly await to see which team will rise to the top, which and which players will become breakout stars. I mean, who would have thought San Diego State was going to make it to the championship last year, right? With so much excitement, looking at potential contenders, here's my way too early top 25 for the college men's basketball. But keep this in mind. While there's still many unknowns, one thing is for sure. We're in for one hell of a ride. So let's get started. At number uno, I have Duke. The retain of Kyle Filipovsky, along with Tyrese Proctor and Mark Mitchell, has helped the Blue Devils secure the number one spot in my rankings. While Jeremy Roach is still deciding uh, his NBA future, though Mackenzie McGobo, a top 10 recruit, has also reopened his recruitment. So that kind of leaves us a lot of questions, but nothing that the Blue Devils can't overcome. And number two, I have Marquette. They were my dark horse last year as well. Marquette's roster has minimal change had minimal changes over the since the end of the season. I expect Oliver McKenzie's testing uh, to continue testing the NBA draft waters, but he I do expect him to return. Coach Shaka Smart is expected to bring back all five starters from the team that won them both the Big East regular season and the conference tournament titles despite being predicted to finish ninth in the preseason and is unlikely to suffer another early exit from the tournament. And that's why they're my dark horse this year once again. So far, Kansas I have at number three. Kansas has moved up in the rankings after adding transfer Timberlake and Morris. And now with Hunter Dickinson, they are just behind Duke for one of the top spots. Okay, I was kind of fighting between them putting them at three. Everybody's actually putting them at number two, but I just like market a lot more. Bring back, adding, I mean, sorry, bring back more consistent talent. The Jayhawks front court duo of Dickinson and Adams Jr. is complemented by Morris and Timberlake, and provide, which provides more offensive options for pass first guard, uh, pat, I'm sorry, the for first year guard, Dejuan Harris Jr. Sorry. Okay. Number four, I have UConn. 
UConn's ranking fell from the top spot after Adam Sinago declared for the NBA draft. That, that was a huge loss for them. But prioritizing his his career over his professional career over college was this his decision, and you know, good luck in the NBA. Nevertheless, the team has a suitable replacement in Donovan Klingen, and they are waiting to hear the decision from Andrew Jackson Jr. and Tristan Newton. Depending on what happens there, they could move up or they could go back down. At number five, I have Michigan State. So Michigan State already is already a promising team. They have improved with the return of Tyson Walker and Malik Hall. And the addition of five-star recruit Xavier Brooker and Jeremy Fears adds even more to this team. The team now boasts a skilled, experienced backcourt back with increased depth and explosiveness. Mwah. At number six, I have Gonzaga. Mark Few reloaded his roster quickly after the departure of many key players with two significant commitments from Graham Ike and Ryan Neymar. Neymar and the team is still expected to continue their recruiting efforts to add even more people to replenish that very much depleted Gonzaga team. At number 7, we have Houston. Despite the potential loss of Trayman Mark and Marcus Sazer, Kelvin Sampson's Houston team managed to secure transfer LJ Cryer and Damian Dunn. The team should also benefit from Jamal Shedd's return after testing the NBA draft waters. At number 8, I have Tennessee. Tennessee has had a successful offseason in the transfer portal, adding Jordan Gain and Chris Landum and Dalton Connect and, and the all-returning all-SEC guard Santiago Vescovi for another year. So that's, that boosts their perimeter and defensive capabilities. I, I'm happy to see the votes where they're at right now. Number 9, I have FAU. Okay, The Owls won 35 games and reached the Final Four. Are and are expected to retain all five starters despite being a ninth seed in the NCAA tournament and struggling in the first round matchup against Memphis. I even I didn't pick them to win, but they did. Okay, they also had John John Nell Davis and Elijah Martin who are testing the draft waters, but they're more than likely going to come back. That's the only reason why I have them at nine. Otherwise, I would actually have them a lot higher. But they are likely, like I said, they are likely to return and. Any team coached by Dustin May should be kept should, should keep them in the top ten. If those two do return, I do gotta say they'll be bumped up. Arkansas at number ten. So the Razorbacks, led by Coach Eric Musselman, have secured the commitments of four guards, a skilled forward, and two top thirty freshman recruits. However, it remains to be seen if they will get back two essential players and if they can add a five star recruit in Ron Holland who recently decommitted from Texas. So they can move up or down. At number 11, I have Alabama. Alabama basketball, led by Nate Oates, is awaiting NBA draft decisions from several of their players, hence why they're so low, but has added Aaron Estrada, a back-to-back CAA Player of the Year from Hofstra, and Latrell Winstrow Jr., a transfer from CSU Fullerton. They have stopped pursuing J. Con Walton, but remain active in the transfer portal. I do not like them not pursuing him, but it is what it is. At number 12, I have Kentucky. Several Kentucky Wildcats have entered the NBA draft, while Carson Wallace and Jacob Topping are the only ones foregoing their college eligibility. John Calipari has recruited the top-ranked class in the nation, with promising scorer Justin Edwards, DJ Wagner, and Robert Dillingham. There is uncertainty surrounding Oscar Tibishu, Chris Livingston, and Antonio Reeves, who may or may not return to the team. USC is at number 13. Now, USC basketball team will still have a formidable backcourt despite losing Trey White and Reese Dixon Waters to the transfer portal. This is the reason why they're going to have that is because of the additions of Bronny James, who will serve as a reliable third option on offense, Isaiah Collier, the nation's top recruit, and Bogey Ellis, an all-conference player and the team's leading scorer. So USC is looking up. At number 14, I have the I have St. Mary's. So Randy Bennett got a boost last month when Alex Dukas announced he was returning for another season. Now the Gales have a solid score score of returners for next season, including Dukas 
Aiden Mahaney, and Mitchell Saxon. Additionally, they have added Augustus Marciolinus, Jordan Ross, and Mason Forbes to their team. At number 15, we have Creighton. Creighton has had a mixed offseason. This is why I kind of, I didn't know where to put them, so I just kind of put them like, just kind of, eh. No, because of their departure of Ryan Neymar, but the acquisition of Steve Ashworth was a positive thing. Meanwhile, the team still awaiting the NBA decision of Ryan Kalbrenner, while Baylor Schreiner confirmed his return for another year. I think if we had a little more solid knowledge of who's coming back, they probably may be higher or lower. At number 16, I have the Baylor Bears. Bears. Baylor's basketball coach, Scott Drew, has a rebuilding task in the backcourt with the departure of King George, Adam Flagler, and LJ Cryer. However, he's bringing in two promising freshmen in Langston, Love, Langston and Love who return um, bleh, to the team, while Jaden Nunn is expected to provide quality defense and shooting. Jalen Bridge could also have a standout season in the front court. So, positive things for Baylor. But some rebuilding to do. At number 17, I have Purdue. Purdue has already considered Zach Eddie's departure in their initial you no know, decisions of what they need to do, which is amazing. I honestly, I'm still 50-50 on them, hence why they're at 17. Still, they are there. They are fully rostered. Okay. Uh, uh, to me. They're, since they're awaiting the you no know, Eddie's decision of whether he's going to enter the after or not, Purdue is really just kind of there. If Eddie stays, Purdue will be a top contender in both the national and the Big Ten scene. But if he goes, the team will have to depend on younger players to step up, which that's yet to be seen if they have that kind of talent. <laughs> At number ten, twin, I'm uh, number eighteen. I'm sorry, I have my Texas A&M Aggies. No, Texas A&M basketball team's ability to continue their winning streak from last season is questioned. We have a lot of we had a lot of players leave and from the transfer portal to the NBA draft, but they will have to rely on Wade Taylor the fourth, who averaged sixteen point three points and three point nine assists per game last year. Now he is expected to receive preseason All American recognition. If they can build around him, I think we'll be good to go. At number 19, I have Colorado. Colorado's men's basketball team is projected to significantly improve next season with the addition of Cody Williams and Eddie Lampkin Jr. They even added KJ Simpson and Tristan De Silva. The team should show the team has shown flashes of potential, but just needs to be a little more consistent. Consistent. Which now that they have added more pieces, I think they can. At number 20, I have Miami. After his outstanding performance last season that earned him the ACC Player of the Year title and a spot in the Final Four, Isaiah Wong declared for the NBA draft, leaving a huge gap in the Miami's lineup. Coach Jim Laranga must re- rely on returning players like Najel Pack, Wuga Poplar, not uh, Narchar Omir and Binsley Joseph to step up to, to to replace Wong. Still, they will also need to find an another dependable scorer to kind of fill in and uh, fill in that gap. So uh, we'll see what happens. At number twenty one, I have Wisconsin. The Badgers will have will have almost the same team as last season since Tyler Wall will return for another year. Yay! Although they will need to make it to the NCAA tournament, they didn't make it to the NCAA tournament last year. The team did win seven games against tournament teams, so that's good. They've also added new players like AJ Storm from St. Jones, who will provide help from the perimeter. So, I think this year Wisconsin will make the tournament. No, they, they were in a positive move. At 22, I have the North Carol North Carolina. Coach Hubert Davis has set a strong foundation for the North Carolina Tar Heels' upcoming season, with returning players R.J. Davis and Armando Beckett and transfer Cormac Ryan and Harrison Ingram. The team should be able to show potential to add even more talent 
like potential top recruits Ian Jackson and Ellie Cadu. This team is poised to make a huge run in the NCAA tournament this coming year, but we have to wait and see if they can mesh together. At 23, we have Maryland. The Terrapins will benefit from the turn of Jameer Young and Dante Scott, who will play another year due to the NCAA's extra year of eligibility. Lucky for them. With the addition of SPN 100 recruit Deshaun Harris-Smith and Jamie Kayser, Maryland's basketball team looks promising for the upcoming season. Although they will have to replace some wing scoring, overall, I'm very excited to see the Terrapins play this year. At 24, we have Arizona. The Arizona men's basketball team has lost Kirk Kreza and Azula Tubelis, leading to gaps in the team's lineup. Although some players have returned, coach Tommy Lloyd must recruit new talent to fill in these gaps. Otherwise, I don't see them keeping this um, uh, this state any much longer. Like They're, they're going to drop from 24. And 25, we have the runner-ups from last year, the San Diego State Aztecs, who reached the national championship game last season, faced uncertainties in their rankings due to the huge roster changes that have happened, with some players exploring the NBA draft and transfer portal, while others have just completely left. However, the addition of USC transfer Reese Dixon Waters is a positive move for them, and there's still a chance that Darion Tramiel may return. So... We'll see what happens with the Aztecs. In conclusion, predicting the top 25 men's basketball teams is still too early. Let's be serious, but this is fun. I love it. I love doing it. The season is just up, it's just getting underway, and there will surely be plenty of surprises along the way. However, based on early performances and rankings, there are some teams to keep an eye on, okay? Based on everything we're seeing. It will be interesting to see how the season plays out and which teams ultimately rise to the top and cut those nets up, nets down. But Panda, take us to our next topic. Thank you for that, Panda. And for those listening, we're going to talk about Astros pitcher, Hunter Brown. So, like I said, no, we're going to talk about one of the most exciting rookies in baseball. Hunter Brown of the Houston Astros. He's so exciting. I loved him so much because it's just amazing. He took me by surprise, ladies and gentlemen. He's taken me by surprise. Now, Brown has been making waves in the league since his debut last season. His performance on the mound has made him you know, one of the most promising young players in the game. Okay. So, a little background on him. He was drafted in the fifth round by the Astros in 2019 in the MLB, of the MLB draft. Then he went to play for the minors uh, for Trey City Valley Cats and Fayetteville Woodpeckers. Okay? <clears throat> After that, he was called up to the big leagues and made his debut uh, on September 4, 2021 against the Seattle Mariners where he struck out three batters in two innings. So, you know, coming out of college... They liked him. They picked him up. Then they said, hey, you got a little bit of development to do, which he did. And let's send you down to the minors to learn. They loved him so much after learning. He came back and ended up uh, striking out three batters in two innings. Perfect. His development showed when he came to the end, uh, to the big leagues, the, no, to the show, when he, no, when, when the way he was pitching. Okay, now a little more on Hunter Brown. He is a right-hander pitcher with a fastball. I mean, a very fastball. I mean, his fastball is so fast, he can reach up to 100 miles per hour. All right, he does have a tendency to have an aggressive play style, pitching style, which some people may, are not a fan of, hence why he dropped so far to the fifth round. I think if he was a little more conservative but aggressive, you no, know, he might have been being drafted a lot uh, earlier, but you know it is what it is. But he has shown and proven that he's not afraid to challenge hitters with his fastball, which you have to do. You can't be afraid of these hitters. You can't be afraid to tell them, "Hey, I don't care if you're a judge or you're a Vanderbilt. I don't care who the hell you are. I don't care if you're a." Uh, golden bad, golden glove, uh, a World Series MVP. I don't care. 
I am going to throw my fastball at you, and you're not going to hit it. And that's what you need. He's, he also has a slider and a changeup in his arsenal that he can use to keep the batters off balance, which allows a real a real sense of diversity in his uh, ability to throw the ball, okay? You never know what he what he's going to do and you never truly know how what know what can happen, which makes it makes it exciting to watch. But what makes it even better is that even though he can do a changeup, a fastball, a slider, one of his greatest strengths, which honestly just it, it baffles me, because when I was watching this kid, I'm like, how is he doing that? Like, damn, that's actually that's pretty good. His biggest strength as a pitcher is the ability to generate swings <clears throat> and misses from those hitters. Like he's he's been doing it all this season. <clears throat> I, I, I don't understand how he's doing it. Uh, you know, he, he's actually, you know, he's actually very good at it. I think he needs to refine it a little more and he can be one of the best. No, but it's just, wow. I'm, I'm like looking at him, looking at it. I'm like, dang, you know, because of that being that ability to generate swings and missing, he has a high strikeout rate, which is why people are taking notice. No, he is a, he is a testament uh, to his own dominance in the mound. Which again, for a two-time World Series championship team, that's what you want. Now, Brown also has a good command of his pitches, which allows him to work in the corners of the strike zone and keep the batters guessing. And that is what you have to look at here, ladies and gentlemen. As, you want, as a pitcher, you want to keep the batters guessing and saying, well, what is he going to do next? What is he going to do? But when you watch this kid play, I've seen him throw two fastballs back-to-back, which you rarely see, and then throw a, a changeup out of freaking nowhere. Now, mind you, I'm not a big uh, baseball guy. I don't always watch it, but when I do, obviously, I'm going to watch my Astros, and then... I see this kid perform, I mean play, I'm sorry, and it's like I never see a changeup. But I see a fastball, a slider, and all these other things, and then last before I turn the TV, you know, watch something else, boom, there's a changeup, and then you don't see anything else. Or you don't see a slider the whole game, you know, the whole time, and then he'll boom, he'll throw a slider out of nowhere. It's just he keeps the batters guessing. And that's why he has such a high strike crowd rate, and that's amazing for such a young guy such a young talent, it's ridiculous. Okay? Hunter Brown, and, and the no, the best part is that Brown, Hunter Brown is still a very young player in this, ladies and gentlemen. So his potential, I mean, if, if you tell me his potential is anything less than the, the sky, you, you're done. Okay? You need to go, go watch this kid's film and go tell me that his potential is not sky high. I mean, I've seen batters hit those corners and keep the stri- the the batters, you know, off balance and and swinging for swinging and missing all over the place, but never like this kid does. I mean, I think, uh, and honestly, I can't even think of someone in the MLB that I've seen in my mind that that compares. To what this kid, but I'm sure there's somebody out there that, that he can compare to. I'm sure there is, but to me, it, not nothing that comes to my mind. But he's that. That's how because that's how good he is. Okay, he also has the tools to become a dominant striker uh, with pitching in the majors. And again, I'm gonna repeat that over and over. He has all the tools. The Astros are a very good team. No, I mean, if the Astros aren't excited about him, I am. But I know the Astros are excited about finding getting him. Now, Brown does need to continue to refine his pitching and improve his command as he gains more experience. That will as he gains more experience, that will happen. You no, know, here in the major leagues, which is good, and that's what you want. And he seems like a kid that is willing to learn more and develop more. And again, if you don't have that, then what the heck are you doing here, right? 
and he wouldn't even have made it to the big leagues had he not had this ability already. So, really, that point is moot. Now, I do have to add that it is worth noting that Brown has struggled in his brief scene and the majors, okay? Even though he has a high walk rate, he has given up quite a few runs. No, however, this is what most would say is a common issue with young pitchers, okay? It happens, you get cocky, and you let it go. Nothing that can't be taught and learned, okay? If Brown can show that he can bounce back from this that kind of adversity, adversity, uh, sorry, then I think he, he was going to be fine. Okay, again, it is a common issue with young players to over uh, overdo it and say, "Hey, you can't touch me!" Boom, strike, run, 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 run. I mean, I think he's given up. Uh, Six, seven runs and once, and it was kind of bad, you know. So, either ways, you know, it's he's young, he can learn it. It's nothing to worry about. And honestly, I'm not worried about it. And I'm the first one to say, Nope, we suck. Nope, mm -mm. we're done. We're done. We're done. And, and honestly, with, with him, I, I don't, I don't feel that way. So, I know he's gonna get better at that. In conclusion, though, ladies and gentlemen. Hunter Brown is a name that baseball fans should be paying attention to. He has the potential to become one of the top pitchers in the game. And his journey to the majors it's, has been impressive so far. He's, he ha, he, with his dominant stuff at the mound and aggressive pitching style, Brown will surely be a force to be reckoned with, with for the years to come. And Astros, please, 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 please keep him for the duration of his life in uh, in Houston please he is he, he's going to be your starting pitcher pitcher here in the next few years no let him develop him please come on he is going to be he's the future of the Astros we cannot let this guy walk we just cannot okay perfect that being said panda take us to the next thing <laughs> Thank you for that, Panda. And as you guys could see, that is all the time that we have for today. We do appreciate you guys listening and taking the time to watch our show. I do appreciate it every single time. Thank you so much. But, of course, tell us down in the comments what you guys think about Bronny and LeBron James playing. Is it even going to be feasible? I mean, we obviously see that two of the three challenges are there. You know, LeBron James is playing at a high level into his late age. Bronny is becoming NBA talent caliber level. Can a team really bring in that kind of money? It could be the Lakers, Cleveland maybe. Shoot, go to the Spurs, play for Popovich for a year or two. Maybe they bring another championship. I wouldn't mind that. Tell me what you think about my way too early top 25s, okay? I mean, it is way too early. Honestly, until we know the decision of half of these players, these rankings are going to change in the next few weeks as players come back, leave, stay, additions, subtractions, everything. But still, very exciting to watch. And, of course, tell me your uh, you know, your two cents on Hunter Brown, you know, the Astros pitcher. I think he's a great player, and I'm excited to see him. And I, can't, I need to go find his jersey. That's what I need to do. So somebody sent me money to buy his jersey or just buy me his jersey. Yeah, that'd be cool. I like that. I completely agree to that. Yeah, yep, yep. As always, guys, follow us on all social media to include Instagram, Facebook. Instagram, Facebook, uh, TikTok. Uh, what else is there? That... Uh, Facebook, everything else. No, yeah, th there's just a million and one things, okay? Also, you can follow, you can listen to us now on all major podcasting uh, platforms to include Google Podcasts, Podcast Index, TuneIn plus Alexa, Pocket Cast, Overcast, Castro, Cat, CastBox, Podfriend, and Godspeed. Just search 
uh, the Sporty Saving Podcast or go to our links uh, there and you can find them. You can also go to our Buzzsprout uh, website and you can find it everything there as well. Of course, just search for the Sporty Saving Podcast and you'll find us on all your major platforms. Of course, guys, watch us live, watch us on person to person on Wednesdays on the RYM YouTube page and on Saturdays on Roku TV. Get excited because we have great shows coming up and I just, you know, I can't wait for it. Can't wait for it. So thank you so much for listening, guys. We appreciate everything you guys do for us and we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye. Come on.